Last week, my family and I got to spend a little bit of time down in Florida. We took the boys to Universal Studios, and we had a lot of fun for the most part. Our first day we were there, we went to Islands of Adventure. They have some more of the, the roller coasters, and one of the roller coasters that they have there is called the Velocicoaster. And the Velocicoaster is one of the, the more intense rides that they have at Universal Studios. And my oldest son, he loves roller coasters. But sometimes, before he jumps on a roller coaster, he gets a little apprehensive. And so I kind of have to push him a little bit. And then he rides it, and then he loves it. And he's like, oh, that was so fun. Let's do it again. So as we're making our way up to the Velocicoaster, my youngest son sees the coaster, and his eyes are huge. He's like, I, I can't ride that. I'm like, you can ride it. And, and we start giving him pep talk, and he gets in the line. He's like, I don't want to ride this ride. And I'm like, oh, I've been through this before as a parent. Just got to push him along a little bit, and he'll have the same reaction as his brother had, and he'll love it. And mind you, this is the second ride that we're going to ride of the day, the second ride that we're going to ride since we've gotten in the park. And we go through the line, and you have to go through through metal detectors to get on this ride so they make sure nothing's in your pockets. So we empty our pockets out in the locker, go through the metal detectors, and then we get into this holding room where they play a, a video. And on the video is Chris Pratt and character telling everybody, you do not want to ride this ride. It's exceptionally dangerous, and there is no, there is no point to riding this ride. Turn around now if you want to live. <laughs> And I got an eight-year-old with me who's already scared to be on the ride that I'm pretty much forcing to be on the ride. And he just looks like he's on the verge of tears. But I grew up a generation ago where it was like, you don't cry, you just tough it out. And so I'm like, come on, buddy, you'll be fine. And we get on the ride, and they get us all set in. And the ride attendant looks at him before the ride takes off. And are you, he looks at him, and he asks, are you sure you want to ride this ride? And I answer for him. I'm like, yes, he's sure. He wants to ride this ride. They give us the thumbs up. We go out on the ride. We ride. His older brother and I, we're having a blast. I turn around during the ride, and I thought he passed out. He was absolutely miserable. He was absolutely miserable. And we get off the ride, and he's like, I'm never riding that again. Thanks for making me ride that, Dad. And we're like an hour into the, our vacation at this point. <sighs> at least I have one who loves roller coasters with me. A couple years ago, I went to Cedar Point. Uh, which is the best amusement park I've, I've ever been to. And I'm a little partial because it was the amusement park that I went to growing up, but 18 roller coasters. If you're a roller coaster fan, it's just an, an exceptional place to be. And there's a, there's a roller coaster there called Steel Vengeance, and it was the first time that, that I got to ride Steel Vengeance. I had my older son with me, and you, similar, you have to put all your belongings in lockers, and then they split the line up in two different directions, and you just get to pick which side you want to go on, right or left. And you have a choice to make. And, and he said, which, which way do we want to go, Dad? And I said, right. And so we went right. And we sat in line for 30 minutes as we watched the left side of the line just blow past us. And person after person getting on the ride, well, we were just stuck in line. Well, the ride was so great, we, we wanted to ride it again. And we, we went through the line, we got to the lockers, and my son looked at me and said, which side, Dad? I said, well, Left. We, we've seen what happens. Let's go left. So we went left. And we stood in line for 30 minutes as the right side just kept breezing past us, person after person. We went away, and later in, in the day, as the park was getting ready to close, we went and we rode the ride for a third time. And he looked at me as we got to the lockers. He said, don't pick. I've got this. <laughs> and he picked the line. And we did not have to wait. It just kept, just kept blowing right through. We pretty much got right on the ride. And he just looked at me and said, I need to make the choices from now on. I'm like, oh, this kid. Sometimes in life it seems that way. Sometimes in life it seems like you can't make a right choice. Sometimes in life it seems like everybody else is making a great choice. But you can't make a right choice. But sometimes in life it just seems like no matter what choice you're faced with making, there's no great outcome possible. We've been looking at the last days and the last hours of Jesus' life. We've seen that he was betrayed We've seen that he was arrested. We've seen that he, he stood before people 
We saw that his friends abandoned him. We saw how it ended for Judas, who betrayed him. And now we continue our look at the last hours of Jesus' life today as we look at the interaction that's one of the most famous interactions of Jesus as he stands before Pontius Pilate. So if you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us this morning in the Bible app. It's a free resource that you can download in the app store that you utilize. And once you've installed the Bible app on your device, there's a feature within it called events. And there you can either enable your locations or type in zip code 54201 and Lakeside Community Church will pop up. You can follow along with us that way this morning. If you have a traditional Bible with you, we're in the New Testament book, the Gospel of Matthew. It's the very first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to start in verse 15 here in just a minute. And if you're joining us via the stream this morning, thank you so much for joining us. The verses will be available on your screen below as we continue to look at the last hours of the life of Jesus. And we pick up today in Matthew chapter 27, verse 15, where we read these words. Now, at the feast of the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. So the, they have a feast, and the governor has a tradition. And his tradition is to issue a pardon. But it's, it's not the governor's discretion so much. I mean, certainly some of that played into it. But what this was, is, this was a, a mark of goodwill to people. This was a way to, to make sure that you were popular with the crowd. And, and you would issue a pardon, but you would put it out. And you would want people to speak into it. And you would want to appease the crowd. You would want to earn their favor by the pardon that you would issue. This was a custom that was going on, and, and there would be a pardon that was issued. And Matthew continues. And they had a, then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? So these are the options that are available. Barabbas, he's a prisoner and he's a criminal who's gained fame. Sometimes there, there's just those criminals and for whatever reason, either their crimes are so horrific or because they're just so notorious in what they accomplish they are a household name nowadays we make mini series about them in those days they didn't make mini series but they would just talk about them and there was a notorious prisoner barabbas who was well known to the people they knew about his crimes they knew about him and he was a prisoner and Pilate, he offers them up here's your choice to choose the pardon is it going to be barabbas a criminal so notorious that you know about him, you know about his misdeeds, you know about what he's done? Or is it going to be about Jesus? Are you going to release Jesus? Who are you going to choose? The well-known criminal or Jesus? And you can see politically how Pilate is, is starting to move here. How he's starting to work. He's starting to present people... Uh, an option that he thinks is a no-brainer. He's starting to present people with a choice that they can make. And he knows, he knows the temperature of the religious, religious leaders. He knows the temperature of even the crowd. But what he's trying to do is he's trying to orchestrate, the, he's trying to orchestrate things behind the scenes. And so he offers them this choice. Barabbas or Jesus, what do you choose? The well-known criminal or the person who made the religious leaders mad? What are you going to choose? And now we're given a glimpse. We're given the commentary of what's actually going on in, in Pilate's mind and in his heart. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him, Jesus, up. For Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus and demanded he die. And delivered Jesus up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Pilate knows what's going on. He's astute. You don't rise to this level in rank. You don't 
you don't rise to this level and position without having a, a good temperature of, of, of what's going on. He knows what's going on. He understands what's going on. He understands the motivations. He understands what drives people. He understands all of those things. And he's basically trying to passively present a way that Jesus is going to be excused. That Jesus is going to be the one who's issued the pardon, but he's not going to have to deal with the political fallout from that decision. That's what he's trying to do behind the scenes. And then you throw on this layer that any married man can, can attest to. Now his wife's nagging him. And his wife's coming to him and he's, she's saying have nothing to do with Jesus. So not only does he already know what he should do, but now his wife knows what he should do as well. And she's not shy about telling him that. And gentlemen, this is just another good reminder that if your wife knows something that you already know and she's reminding you of that, you should probably just listen. Probably just listen to her. She's saying, I've had these dreams, these nightmares, because of Jesus. Make the right choice. Have nothing to do with him. Pilate already knows. He already knows the motivations. He already knows the reason that he's in the state that he's in. He already knows the reason that Jesus is before him. And now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And here are the religious leaders. It's out of envy. It's out of their own inability to see that Jesus is the very fulfillment of everything that they had anticipated, but they just couldn't see it. And so instead of accept him, instead of receive him, they reject him. And in their rejection, they don't just leave it to themselves. No, they stir people up. This is nothing new. And this isn't something that only happened back then. Have you ever noticed how militant some people are? Because they have determined in their own minds and in their own hearts that they want nothing to do with Jesus. And they're not content they're not content just for that to be the case in their life. No, they want to tell everybody how horrible Jesus is and how stupid you are if you're a follower of God. And the question you have to ask is this. Why does my faith in Christ bother them so much? In this case, the answer is because there's an agenda. Because they were threatened. So the religious leaders are working behind the scenes, stirring up the crowd, and telling the crowd to go and vote for Barabbas. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. The crowd, they had a choice. And they chose Barabbas. And today you have a choice. Jesus stands in front of you. And his heart is that you would follow him. His heart is that you would love him and you would accept him. His heart is that you would recognize the need for a savior and recognize that there he is in front of you. And yet God loves us enough to give us free will. God loves us enough to give each and every one of us the choice that we have to make. And it is the most important choice you are ever faced with. It is the most important choice that you will ever have to make. But you have to make that choice. As Jesus stands before you today, what is your answer? The answer of the crowd was rejection. The answer of the crowd was give us Barabbas. And maybe your answer is rejection of Jesus. And maybe it's not because of another criminal, but maybe it's for a whole host of other reasons. Maybe it's because, honestly, you just don't want to honor God with your life. 
you recognize that following Jesus causes you to have to die to yourself in some ways. You say, I I don't want to do that. And you reject Jesus. Not for Barabbas, but for you. Or or maybe you reject Jesus because you think, well, people are going to think of me differently. And you reject Jesus, not for Barabbas, but because you think it's going to make you more popular or or you're going to fit in better. The same choice the crowd has, each and every one of us must answer. And each and every one of us must choose. As God stands before each and every one of us, we all have to decide, who do we choose? Do we choose Jesus? Jesus. And our parents can't make that choice for us. Our spouses can't make that choice for us. Our friends can't make that choice for us. Our coworkers can't make that choice for us. Our children can't make that choice for us. We must choose, each and every one of us. Because will we choose Jesus? And it's the rejection of the crowd as they chose Barabbas that worked in God's plan to enable each and every one of us to have that choice, to choose Jesus. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Crucifixion is one of the most horrific ways that people could die. They would take the prisoner and they would drive nails through their wrists because if they drove the nails through the, through the flesh of their hands, that their hands would, would rip through. They weren't strong enough to sustain them. Drive spikes through their legs. They would hang on the cross. In agony, they would have to lift up in order to be able to breathe. And this is the outcome that the crowd chose for Jesus. This is the outcome that the religious leaders worked behind the scenes To secure. And this is the outcome that our Creator, before He created the world, knew He would one day endure. Because God loves us all so much that he's given us the choice to make. Not just the choice that we make of whether or not we'll follow Jesus, but he's given us the choice to make every single day of what we'll choose. Whether we will choose God's way or our way. Whether we'll choose God's standards or our standards. And God has has a, a, a set. God has a set of standards We don't measure up. Now, now some people are, are closer than, than others, but the problem is God's scale isn't whether we're good enough. God's scale isn't whether our, our good outweighs our bad. 
Because God's holy and he's perfect. So God's standard is one of perfection. He's given us all the choices to make, and none of us always make the right decision. In fact, I'd argue there isn't a single day that goes by where we make every decision right. But God still loves us. To the point that he's willing to be rejected. To the point that he's willing to be crucified so that we're not stuck in our imperfection. So that our rebellion doesn't determine our outcome. The crowd cries out, crucify him. Crucify. Pilate knows in his head, this is not just. He knows what's be, he knows the, the political aspects of this and the theological aspects Pilate does not understand. But the political aspects, he sees that what's happening here is unfair. It's unjust. It is not right. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Pilate says, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. But Pilate's a politician. And make no mistake about it, the goal of every politician is to remain in power. And he recognizes if a riot breaks out, this is not good. This is not good for his political legacy. This is not good for him remaining in power. When the Roman government would hear about this, they would replace him. And so he looks at the crowd. And he takes water. And he washes his hands. And he says, the blood of Jesus... It's on you. It's not on me. And notice what the crowd says. His blood be on us. And on our children. And what is so sadly ironic. that the people screaming that never understood. That the blood of Jesus was in fact for them. And it was in fact for their children. That the blood of Jesus be on us, not as something we cry out in rage, not as something that, that we just we're bloodthirsty and we want we want to see Jesus crucified. No, 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 no. But the blood on us that we recognize that there is a need for our salvation because of our sin. And the cost of our sin is death. And the blood of Christ paid that penalty for us. That what this crowd shouted out to mock and to ridicule and, and bloodthirsty lust to see Jesus killed is the very message that we cling to and the very message that we so desperately need that the blood of Jesus be on us and the blood of Jesus be on our kids because it is through the blood of Jesus that we can experience salvation and that we can be saved. crowd had no idea how profound their statement was. To the blood of Jesus be on us and on our children. And then Pilate released for them Barabbas. 
and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Pilate's heard the crowd. He releases the notorious criminal. He has Jesus whipped. Delivers him over to be crucified. And every part within us cries out, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. That Christ who reigns supreme, and Christ who creates all, and Christ who created the soldiers who are now mocking him and belittling him, is beaten. It's humiliated as they strip his clothes off of him and throw a scarlet robe on him. They take thorns and they twist them together in a crown and they force it on his head as the thorns dig into his flesh and blood begins to pour out. They put a reed in his right hand. Show a scepter. And kneeling before him, they cry out, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Now that they've mocked him, now that they've ridiculed him, now that they've belittled him, let Jesus out. Let him out to be crucified. And we look at this and we say, this isn't right. This isn't fair. This is injustice. And it's through all of that that God offers us grace. It's through all of this that God offers us forgiveness and redemption and hope and grace. And there's a sense within most of us of we want fairness and we want justice, but there's nothing fair and there's nothing just about this. And when we look at grace, we recognize all the more. There's nothing fair and there's nothing just about grace. Because what is grace? Grace is God's gift to us that we don't deserve. We can't earn it. God has the standard and his standard's perfection and we don't measure up. And what's fair and what's right is for us to deal with the consequences of our own actions. I thank God for the unfairness of grace. And it should stir something within us. It should stir something within our hearts and within our souls as we're reminded of just how unfair grace is. But this should, it should stir us up too. To change the way that we see things and people. 
It should cause us to recognize the, the person who doesn't deserve redemption is me. When I realize that God has given me His grace, even though I don't deserve it, I can't help but want other people to experience that same thing. There is nothing fair about grace. And it's offered not just to me, and not just to you, but it's offered to all of us. But what choice are we going to make? Because Jesus stands before us all and his arms are open wide and the invitation is that we would experience this grace which was provided for us when he went and he died on the cross for our sins. The wages of sin, the cost of our sin is death. But the gift of God is life everlasting. Through what Jesus did on our behalf. And this week we have the opportunity to remember the sacrifice of Christ. We have the opportunity next Sunday to, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. That's, that's what we're going to do this week. As we remember, we remember this Friday night we're going to have a night of worship and communion 630 here. We hope you'll join us for that on Good Friday. As we reflect and we remember on the sacrifice of Jesus? We celebrate the fact that even in the sacrifice of Jesus, as unfair as it was, it was the gateway to our ultimate hope. Standing before us all is Jesus. And we have a choice that we must make. Will we choose Jesus? Or will we choose ourselves? Will we choose Jesus? Or will we choose something else? The choice before us is one that nobody else can answer for us. The crowd had the luxury of joining together. The answer we must give is individual. And it's the most important choice we will make in our entire lives. Who do you choose? God, I pray that we would choose you. I pray, God, that we would surrender our hearts and we would surrender our lives and we would, we would recognize that there is nothing fair about grace. God, you lovingly extend it to us anyway. I pray for the person here, I pray for the person watching online that's never experienced the hope of salvation. And I pray today would be that day. Even in the quietness of their heart right now, God, they would surrender their life to you, confessing their sin, accepting your gift and choosing to live for you. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for redeeming us. Thank you for offering us hope that is undeserved. 
I pray it would shape the way that we live each and every day. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen.